Certain aspects of it, yes. Okay. Did you recommend new charges as a result of those criticisms? We weren't able to prove matters. I didn't, I couldn't say under the guiding principles that we'd be able to prove matters beyond a reasonable doubt because of lack of recollections, passages of time, inconsistent statements, so no, we didn't. So no, you did not, right. Uh, did you suggest any significant changes to how future investigations should be conducted? And I guess it's for others to judge whether there are significant suggestions um, or not. I think that uh, more disciplined uh, approaches to these matters um, can be affected by some of the recommendations we made, yes. Okay. Um, I would say you did not suggest any significant changes. Um, in the FBI's statement in response to your report, it, it said that the FBI conduct you examined was, the, was, quote, the reason that current FBI leadership already implemented dozens of corrective actions, which have now been in place for some time. Mr. Durham, do you know why the corrective actions have been in place for some time at the FBI? Um, I think I know, yes. Okay. Is it because the Inspector General finished his report three and a half years ago, making recommendations for changes that the FBI could make? In part. Okay. In the four years that you spent tracking down Donald Trump's conspiracy theories, other investigations were conducted and completed. These investigations and the Horowitz investigation primarily identified the problems with the FBI investigation. But the one thing the Horowitz report did not do was give Donald Trump and my MAGA Republican colleagues across the aisle talking points for their conspiracy theories. On that front, you delivered. Um, I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to my colleague, Mr. Schiff. Mr. Term, um, your report attempts to uh, make a case that the Clinton investigations of Clinton were given more favorable treatment to that of President Trump. Um, but you leave out one very notable example, and that is your report makes no discussion of the fact that the email investigation to Hillary Clinton was made very public before the election, was it not? Um, if, if you had I James it, Comey it, discussing Hillary Clinton's emails in the days leading up to the election? If I follow your question, I don't think that the report says that the Clinton administration, that Mrs. Clinton was given more favorable treatment. I think what the report says is that the FBI exercised some considerable discipline in how it was going to approach um, those matters as compared to how the FBI people who were involved in Crossfire Hurricane approached why, Crossfire Hurricane. Why, I think that's what why, the report why, Mr. says. Durham, why, Mr. Durham, would you leave out the glaring contrast between the FBI's public discussion of the Clinton investigation right before the election, and it's keeping confidential the Trump investigation. Wasn't that a glaring disparity in how they were both treated? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the, uh, really don't FBI, the, the FBI did and Mr. Comey did what, uh, what they did. I was asked to... Yes, they did what they did, and in glaring contrast to how they treated the Trump investigation, which was kept secret before the election whereas the Clinton investigation was discussed publicly affecting the outcome. Isn't that correct? I can tell you that the FBI had that information gentlemen's and sat on it for months before they acted in yes. gentlemen's uh, making time is a public disclosure. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Durham, thank you for coming to testify today before the committee. I'm a recovering attorney and a former judge. Oh, God love you. Thank you. As such, uh, I know firsthand the importance of of uh, following procedures. I know law enforcement and prosecutors across this nation do that on a daily basis, and they do that because they want to ensure that a criminal investigation is conducted properly. They need to adhere to a full due process of law and fair application of the law, and quite frankly, process matters because how we go about our investigations will either give credibility to our conclusions or will belie our uh, conclusions. Do you agree with that? Wholeheartedly. Uh, would you agree that some of the important steps in an investigation would include simply vetting the initial information and claims, obtaining the relevant documents, talking to the relevant witnesses, determining the credibility of those witnesses and documents, and doing a lot of that by seeking corroboration of what is either provided in written testimony or oral testimony or in documentary form? Is that true? That's absolutely true. 
And the definition of corroboration is not difficult. Evidence that supports or confirms a statement, theory, or finding. It's effectively confirmation. That's what we need in an investigation is we need to confirm whether or not an allegation is true or not, correct? Yes. As your report showed, the FBI did not follow its well-established procedures and did not corroborate the information that they were receiving. Is that fair to say? That's a fair statement. Take, for example, uh, page 54 of your report, you show that the FBI opened a full investigation into George Papadopoulos, but they did so a mere three days after receiving intelligence from Australia. During those three days, do you think the FBI attempted to corroborate the information they had initially received? Um, if, we, if they did, we didn't see any evidence of that fact. In fact, on page 112 in your report, you, you say, quote, despite the lack of any corroboration of the Steele report, sensational allegations, however, in short order, portions of four of the reports were included in the initial Carter Page FISA application without further verification or corroboration of the allegations contained therein. You also state on page 57 about Australia. Australia could not and did not make any representation about the credibility of information, and that's because they couldn't verify or corroborate that information. Is that true? That's correct. You further go on to say on page 57 that, quote, uh, the uh, Office of Special Counsel found no indication from witness testimony, electronic communications, emails, calendar entries, or other documentation that at the time the FBI gave any consideration to the actual trustworthiness of information the diplomats received from Papadopoulos. Do you remember re uh, writing that portion of the report? I do. It seems amazing to me that the FBI would not give consideration to the actual trustworthiness of certain information found in an investigation at this level. You write extensively on how the FBI elected to not interview Carter Page, George Papadopoulos, or Charles, Charles Dolan. Would interviews with those key individuals have helped to corroborate or disprove the information that the FBI was receiving? Yes. Through your investigation, did you uncover any reason as to why the FBI elected to not interview these individuals? I know that the uh, um, people who with operational people doing the investigation were told they could not interview um, Mr. Page um, until um, the seventh floor uh, authorized it, and then the director didn't authorize the interview of Mr. Page until March of 2017. You also noted that it took uh, 75 days to pass the Steele dossier to the Crossfire Hurricane team. It uh, seems to me that that is uh, belying the ability of the investigative team to actually corroborate what the allegations were. W would you agree with that as well? I would, I would, um, I would agree with that. Uh, Mr. Durham, in, in my opinion, a failure to, corro to corroborate information leads to holes in credibility. It also gives rise to potential corruption or actual corruption. The American people now know, based on your report, that during the peak of a presidential campaign, the FBI elected not to follow its own basic procedures and instead launch a polit politically motivated investigation into a leading presidential candidate. I am confident and hopeful that there are still many good agents within the FBI who are there to perform their sacred duty of protecting and serving our nation that undertake investigations on a daily basis without regard to political affiliation. That's my hope. That's my belief. That's my experience. But your report, Mr. Durham, shows that at least top FBI uh, leadership in this case was politically motivated and did not follow longstanding procedures necessary for a proper, uh, proper criminal investigation. I heard you say to, uh, to my colleagues on the left a little while ago, quote, nothing in their files would corroborate the claims. And another quote, quote, not one single fact in the Steele dossier has been corroborated. It is amazing to me that we would go through a high-level investigation like this and fail to adhere to a basic principle of investiga investigative procedures, and that is corroborate the witness testimony and corroborate the evidence. With that, I yield my time, and I thank you for your efforts. Thank you, sir. The gentleman yields back, and I'll recognize Ms. Ross from North Carolina for her questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Durham, for yes, your endurance. Um, you have cited and discussed the Justice Department's principles of federal prosecution. And um, I'd just like you to explain for the public what that is. What are those principles? Sure. You know, the, the general um, principles of federal prosecution, as I've indicated, uh, provide that a federal prosecutor should not bring uh, criminal charges unless he or she uh, believes that the evidence that um, will be admissible at trial 
is sufficient to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and that a jury uh, can convict based on that evidence, and that if the conviction were obtained, uh, then the um, conviction would be sustained on appeal or upheld on appeal. Okay. Those are the basic principles we operate under. Thank you very much. And um, one major goal of the principles is to ensure that individuals' rights are, quote, scrupulously protected. Is that correct? That's correct. And the principles also contain a limitation on identifying uncharged third parties publicly. Is that correct? There is a limitation on that, yes. It states that in all public filings and proceedings, federal prosecutors should remain sensitive to the privacy and reputation interests of uncharged third parties. I'm just quoting it, is that correct? That is correct. Great. Do you believe that you adhered to this limitation in your prosecutorial, prosecutorial filings in the Sussman and Dinchenko cases? Yes. Now, that's very interesting um, because many legal scholars noted that in your filings, you laid out not just the prosecution for the court to consider, but you appeared to be alleging a conspiracy that you did not intend to prosecute. Rather than indicting Mr. Sussman on the narrow charge of lying to the FBI, this is a charge which a unanimous jury of his peers acquitted him of, your filing broadly alleges a vast Clinton conspiracy identifying various individuals um, and at least one of whom you never prosecuted. And after the Sussman indictment was filed on September 16th of 2021, for example, um, President Trump's allies used the broad conclusions you allege to construct a political narrative damaging the reputations of uncharged individuals. In fact, on September 19, 2021, Eric Trump spoke with the Washington Inquirer treating these uncharged allegations as fact. At the next day, on September 20th, 2021, Trump associate Cash Patel told Fox News that the indictment offers a good view into future charges, including what he called a very well laid out conspiracy charge that will envelop people in and around Hillary Clinton's campaign. Did you read these interviews or are you aware of them? I, I did not read them. I can imagine that that's what people were saying, but I yeah. did not read them. I, I don't read a lot of newspapers, so listen to a lot of news. Um, it makes my but life a lot had easier. you known that that was what was going to be done with the indictment, would you have used greater caution? Um, I think we took great care in, in uh, drafting and crafting that uh, indictment and uh, did, to the best of our ability, uh, comply with all of the department's policies and procedures regarding uh, third persons. I think if you take a look at the indictment, um, in any number of instances, for example, people's identities uh, were masked. We didn't use a person's name. So uh, I'm just going to gonna reclaim my time because I think that there were people who were implicated and um, there was not a narrow enough tailoring of the indictment. And then, in fact, after the February 11th filing in the Sussman case, uh, Donald Trump told Fox News that the conspiracy he claims you described but never prosecuted amounted to treason at the highest level and said, if you read the filing and have any understanding of what took place, and I called this a long time ago, you're going to see a lot of other things happening having to do with what really just is a continuation of the crime of the century. This is such a big event Nobody has seen anything like it. And given that kind of politicization of what you did, do you think that you could have exercised more caution again with respect to third parties? I exercised my judgment on, under the uh, guiding principles that I had and whether or not an indictment ought to be returned and decided on that basis. I would say, did I give consideration to what Donald Trump might say about it? I would say that was not part of my consideration. Did Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey is now recognized for his questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Durham, thank you for being here. I know it's been one heck of a slog. I wish that we could, you know, just stick to the matter at hand, which is your report, but it's been interesting. We've been all over the, all over the place. Fidelity, bravery, and integrity. These are the words that have guided the FBI through countless generations. Dishonesty, deception, and corruption, I'm sad to say. The stark contrast and unfortunate reality we now find ourselves in. A reality that has revealed a politicized, weaponized, and corrupted Federal Bureau of Investigation in desperate need, in my opinion, for a complete restructuring. One of the most egregious examples of dishonesty that the Durham report reveals relates to a critical piece on page 16 that summarizes a deeply troubling chain of events. Igor Duchenko, who was instrumental in the formation of the Steele dossier, claimed that one of his subsources was Sergei Milian, a Belarusian American businessman and publicly known to be a Trump supporter. The report goes on to highlight that Danchenko claimed to have received an anonymous phone call from an individual he later claimed to be Milian. Milian. On page 173, it is stated this call supposedly revealed, quote, a well-developed conspiracy of cooperation between the Trump campaign and Russian leadership, end quote. What's the kicker here? The kicker is Danchenko had never met nor spoken with Milian prior to this call and told the Crossfire Hurricane team that despite never actually meeting Milian, he recognized his voice from a YouTube video. This blatant lie was taken at face value by both Christopher Steele and the FBI's crossfire hurricane investigation. Think about that. Everybody think about that. Danchenko was a foreign agent who the FBI was paying, by the way, we haven't talked about that much, hundreds of thousands of your taxpayer dollars tells a blatant lie which leads to four FISA applications and lays the foundation for the Trump-Russia collusion hoax. And that's what it was. You may not like it, but that's what it was. One of the greatest disgraces this country, in my opinion, has ever seen. Americans are literally paying the price for this corruption. Such an egregious and intentional abandonment of the common procedures that FBI agents are supposed to follow truly encapsulates why so many Americans, including myself, are calling for complete restructuring of the FBI. And it is a reason why now, years later, the country finds itself so divided. Mr. Dorm, is it accurate to say the crossfire hurricane investigators made little to no effort to corroborate Danchenko's version of events relating to Milian. Um, that would be correct. Thank you. And is it accurate to say that despite not corroborating this information, that Crossfire Hurricane still used the Milian accusation to bolster the Carter Page FISA applications? And that information was used in the initial FISA application and the three uh, renewal applications. So the answer is yes. Yes. Given the lack of effort by the Crossfire Hurricane investigators to validate Danchenko's assertions about Milian and their use of these unverified allegations in the Carter Page FISA application, does this raise any legal or ethical concerns about the validity of these FISA applications? I think the, um, it's been recognized by the department and certainly by the FISA court that with respect to at least some of those applications, um, they would never have been um, authorized. So it wouldn't have been granted um, had the, the information been disclosed. So it, it did help in achieving the FISA approval? Without question. Okay. I mean, we're getting to the real, these are the real issues. Misinformation, bad people moving forward, 
getting Pfizer applications, doing all that they did. I have one quick last question. Do you believe the FBI has been politicized and weaponized and is in need for complete restructuring? I know I do. I know you have a softer version of it. I think too much happened, too many bad things happened, that, that you just can't move a few people around and make some minor changes. I think you need some major changes. And I also want to say there are many good people that work for the Department of Justice and work for the FBI. Proud to know them. These folks surely were not. Gentlemen's time has expired. The, the, the witness may respond if he chooses. Yeah, I, I, what, I can, what I can say is that there were um, identified, documented, significant failures of um, a uh, highly sensitive, unique investigation that was undertaken by uh, the FBI. I think the investigation clearly reveals that um, decisions that were made were made in one direction. If there was something that was inconsistent with the notion that uh, Trump was involved in um, a well-coordinated conspiracy with the Russians and whatnot, um, that information was um, largely discarded um, or ignored. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's what the facts bear out. Gentlemen, uh, it yields back. The gentlelady from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Special Counsel Durham, for your time today. I yield the balance of my time to my colleague from California, Representative Adam Schiff. I thank you for yielding. Uh, one of my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle took issue with my saying that the Trump campaign invited Russian help, received Russian help, made use of it, and then lied about it. So let's break this down. Uh, let's go to invited Russian help. Uh, Mr. Durham, you're aware of Donald Trump's public statements along the lines of, hey, Russia, if you're listening, hack Hillary's emails, you'll be richly rewarded by the press. You aware of that? I'm aware of that. And are you aware that Mueller found that hours after he made that plea for Russian help, the Russians, in fact, tried to hack one of the email servers affiliated with the Clinton campaign or family? Uh, if that happened, I'm not aware of that. I mean, it could very well. You're, you're not aware no. of that in the Mueller report? So when you say it, you're not just, aware of evidence of collusion in the Mueller report, it's because you apparently haven't read the Mueller report very well, um, if you're not aware of that fact. But let me ask you about something else. Sure. Don Jr., when offered dirt as part of what was described as a Russian government effort to help the Trump campaign, said, if it's what you say, I love it. Would you call that an invitation to get Russian help with dirt on Hillary Clinton? The words speak for themselves, I suppose. I, I think they do. And in fact, he said, especially late in summer. Late in summer was around when the Russians started to dump the stolen emails, wasn't it? Late in the summer, there was information that was um, disclosed by WikiLeaks um, in mid to late July. I think there had spent some in June, and then there was maybe some later in October, was it? I think, but I don't, don't well, hold me to those dates. And this gets to the receipt of help. The second thing I mentioned, receiving Russian help. The dumping of those emails, by the way, just as forecast by what Papadopoulos told the Australian diplomat, that is that the Russians would help by leaking dirt anonymously through cutouts like WikiLeaks and DC leaks. I don't think that's but, exactly what he told the, the Australians, but. Well, he said that the, he was informed that the Russians could help by anonymously re releasing this information, right? Release what? By, anonymous, uh, by anonymously releasing information damaging to Hillary Clinton, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if you read what's in the cable and what's in the report as to what the uh, diplomats uh, reported was, there was a suggestion of a suggestion that the Russians could help they had damaging information as to Mrs. Clinton. Um, and By releasing it anonymously, release. right? And that's exactly what happened, isn't it? I, 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 don't, I don't know. You really don't know? I'm, I'm not sure exactly. When you say exactly what happened. Well, the Russians the released that... stolen emails mm -hmm. through cutouts, did they not? There were emails. It's a very simple question. Did they release WikiLeaks. information, stolen information through cutouts, yes or no? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. That you really what, don't what... know the answer to that? The answer is yes, they did. Through DC leagues. Well, in your mind to... it's yes. Well, <laughs> Mueller's answer was yes. More important than mine, Mueller's answer was yes. Now, that information, of course, was helpful to the Trump campaign, wasn't it? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's any question, but that the Russians intruded into 
um, well, I just want to act into the systems. They released information. And that was helpful to Trump campaign, right? And the, and the conclusion in the ICA and in the uh, Mueller investigation was that the Russians intended to assist. Can you answer Trump. my question, Mr. Durham? That was helpful to the Trump campaign, right? Yeah, that's. And, and Trump made are. use of that, as I said, didn't he, by touting those stolen documents on the campaign trail over 100 times? I, I, I said, I don't really read the newspapers or listen to the news. I don't well, really, find you're, that you're, reliable, you're totally, so I don't know that. Mr. Durham, were you totally oblivious to Donald Trump's use of the stolen emails on the campaign trail more than 100 times? Did I'm that not escape aware of that. your attention? I am not aware of that. Uh, are you aware of the final prong that I mentioned, that he lied about it, that the Trump campaign covered it up? It's the whole second volume of the Mueller report. I hope you're familiar with that. Yeah, that's a section of the report, the second volume relating to was their obstruction of justice. Well, thank you for, for confirming what my Republican colleague attacked me about. Um, now, he also criticized the use of the word collusion, apparently giving private polling data to the Russians while the Russians are helping your campaign. They don't want to call collusion. Maybe there's a better name for it. Maybe they would prefer we just call it good old-fashioned GOP cheating with the enemy. Maybe that would be a little bit more accurate description. Uh, yeah. Because this is what happened, but they seem allergic to calling it for what it is. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Uh, Mr. Dolan, I will quote excerpts from your report describing the FBI actions in Trump's case. You call them sobering, I call them alarming. Rapid opening, made no sense, no sound reason, no explanation, difficult to explain, no follow-up, uncorroborated evidence, unevaluated information, rumors and speculations, thin intelligence, exculpatory statements were not included, misrepresentation of the recorded conversation, noticeable departure, not using typical tools, serious lack of rigor, choose to ingrow red flags, unwarranted delay, ignore nearly all recommendations, didn't disclose intelligence, not in form of inconsistencies, did not give appropriate attention to facts, did not adequately examine, did not receive satisfactory explanation, was not informed, never corrected assertion, never advised, never been apprised, never gave appropriate consideration, no further action, failed to make known, failed to act, failed to follow logical leads, failed to interview, failed to revise the paperwork, failed to take even the basic steps, failed to determine, failed to provide, failed to integrate, failed to fully exploit the materials, failed to critically analyze information, failed to properly consider, failed to correct errors, ignored contrary evidence, was never brought to the attention, intentionally falsified in material documents, fabricated the allegation, omission of material fact, numerous significant defects, 17 material errors and omissions, inaccurate representation, deliberately shut down, told not to write and provide findings orally, incorrectly noted, missed another opportunity, omitted email, omitted information, did not corroborate, never sought to obtain records, resisted efforts, conflicting recollection, troubling failure of recollection, not in a single FBI employee, curious change in assessment, key players declined to be interviewed, lack sufficient probable cause, frustration on the part of investigators, sense of betrayal, highly unusual instruction, director was really, really shocking, and the list goes on. Dolan, with extensive connection to the Democrat Party and access to senior Russian officials and Putin's think tank, was never interviewed, request was denied, case was never opened, Arden instructing to cease all research and analysis related to Dolan. Leadership directed to dedicate no resources to Dolan. FBI interviewed hundreds of individuals, yet they did not interview Dolan. Danchenko failed to properly consider prior Russian counter-espionage case. FBI's validation unit raised serious concern. Management ignored and resisted nearly all recommendations and supported continued payment to him. Jonathan Weiner, special envoy to Secretary Kerry to Libya, who worked as lobbyist for Russian oligarch Deribaska with ties to Putin, disseminated still dossier to the U.S. official and destroyed his records. Deribaska was allowed to buy control and package in uranium company with extensive mining projects in the United States, approved by Secretary Clinton's State Department in 2010. The former head of the FBI's counterintelligence division in New York, McGonagall, involved with this case, recently was accused of taking money from Deripaska. Clinton case from your report stands in stark contrast. Lack of action, considerable caution, never open inquiry, in limbo, linger, defensive brief, and corroborate information, no effort to investigate cease and desist due to the undeclosed concern. Declined to issue subpoenas. Your concern with FBI's reputational harm but it appears to me, using Directus Clopis lexicon, this case has all classic earmarks of collusion and cover-up. However, not one person went to jail, and Clinton campaign operatives like Jake Sullivan now have the highest national security position in our government, who's actually driving a very slow response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
Do you believe that justice has been served? I can speak to what um, my, t my team and I uh, did, which was to try Just to... Just tell me yes or no. Do you believe it has been served? We tried to serve justice to the best of our ability. Okay. I can speak you, on that. You also state Russian intelligence knew of still election investigation for the Clinton campaign before Crossfire Hurricane was open, and still subsources could have been compromised by Russian. However, FBI have not appropriately considered to the possibility that the still reports was Russian disinformation. Is that correct? Um, if we're talking about Mr. Uh, we're talking about Mr. Denchenko? No, no. Just you said, and you, and this is in your report. You say that Russia FBI never considered the possibility that still reports was Russian information and full on part. Is that correct? That they exactly. didn't. Do you know why? I don't know why, but I think okay. that's correct. Another question. Say Chase one FBI spy, and I'm assuming Stephen Halper invited Page at the request of the FBI to conference in UK created Manafort Page conspiracy allegation in direct conflict with his recordings. FBI never fully transcribed recording, misstated the crossfire query can significant and proper fact on Page session conversation. He didn't show up with subpoena and wasn't clothed in very shady uh, case in 1980s. In your report, you were able to establish the CHIs intentionally lied to the FBI. You were not, were not able to establish why and what you did. Um, okay, I'm not sure I... I um... CHIs one. I'm sorry? CHS-1, you said that you were not able to establish that CHS-1 intentionally lied to the FBI. What did you do or not didn't do to establish it? You're not able to establish. Let me see. This is on page 89. The gentlelady is... Time has expired. We'll let the witness answer. I think she's referring to confidential human source number one, Mr. Yeah. Durham. You said you were unable to establish it at the end of your report. This on page 243. So the, the context of that is in the steel, in the steel reporting, uh, one of the pieces of information that had been used in the dossiers was that uh, Mr. Page allegedly but had... What did, did you interview him? What did you do to establish... We've we got to move quickly. Mr. The Chairman, time if, is, um, the gentleman's time has expired. We'll let the witness answer the question. We are going to have to stick close now, closer to the five-minute rule, because they're, they're holding votes on the floor until we finish today's business. Okay, so I can... You can answer real quick, sure. So it, it's one of the things in the Steele report was that Carter Page allegedly had met with two sanctioned Russians when he was uh, in Moscow in, uh, in July. Uh, we were able to uh, establish that uh, that was not the, not the truth. I mean, you look at the evidence that um, that's not true, and the FBI should have been able to detect that, and they didn't detect it. But that was a meeting that supposedly occurred in July of 2016, our meetings, one of them with Mr. Sechin. <clears throat> Later, when the FBI had opened Crossfire Hurricane, and in December of 2016, uh, CHS-1 met with Mr. Page, again, recorded a conversation uh, with Mr. Page, um, and he, uh, several days later, uh, told his handling agent that, um, oh, um, I forgot to tell you that uh, Page uh, said that on his, Page's most recent uh, trip to Russia, where he uh, worked or did, had business interests, um, he met with Sechin. And the FBI, when you look at the communications in the FBI, they're saying, that, you know, that sounds kind of uh, screwy here, but we should look at that. They apparently never looked at that. We went and got the recording of that conversation that had occurred uh, between CHS-1 and Mr. Page in December of 2016. And Page never said that he had met with Sechin on his most recent uh, visit. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I've... Yeah. The overruns, of, I appreciate Understand. the fact to give him a chance to you're, answer. You're definitely going to get asked so, your question. Uh, it'll be the Republicans will be, be, be squeezed. Uh, uh, 
I think I think the gentlelady's time has expired. We'll now go to the to the gentlelady from. I appreciate your answer, Mr. Durham. Yeah. Uh, I think we we understand where you're headed. Uh, the gentlelady from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. St. Louis and I are here today to set the record straight about this political investigation conducted on behalf of the twice impeached, twice indicted, former white supremacist in chief, Donald Trump. From the start, this entire investigation has been an attempt to undermine the findings of the Mueller investigation and distract the people of this country from Donald Trump's corruption. That's why it began just days after the release of the Mueller report. And that's why four years later, and no matter how much my colleagues across the aisle claim, Otherwise, the Durham investigation did not exonerate Mr. Trump or any of his associates. Mr. Durham, I'd like to briefly discuss a few of the different Trump-related items that your report does not touch on. In the interest of time, you can just simply answer yes or no. The Mueller report found that Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort knowingly shared internal polling data and information on battleground states with a Russian spy. Did you find this to be untrue? I did not find that to be untrue. Thank you. The Mueller, thank you for that. The Mueller report found that Mr. Manafort shared this internal polling data with a Russian asset with the expectation it would be shared with Putin-linked oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Did you find this to be untrue? I didn't find it to be untrue, but I didn't look at it either. The Mueller report found that Russian military hackers first targeted uh, Hillary Clinton's personal office Within hours of Trump's infamous July 27, 2016 press conference, which we've heard already, where he said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Did you find this to be untrue? When you say this, what? That, uh, Mr. Trump clearly said that. It was publicly recorded. Did you find, the, the, the Mueller report found that Russian military hackers first targeted her personal office within hours of the infamous press conference right. where Trump said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails. Right. If that was his, did, you find that to, did you find this to be untrue? I, would not, I did not find that to okay. be untrue. Thank you. So again, your investigation, Mr. Durham, did not undercut the basic findings of the Mueller report. Those who read your report as exonerating Donald Trump are willfully deluding themselves and the people of this country. And let's take a step back for a minute. In the chaos created by all these conspiracy theories and other propaganda amplified by right-wing hate machine, the one we continue to hear, a very simple point is getting lost. Republicans will do anything, say anything, and spend any amount of money to hide the basic truth that their leader is a criminal, corrupt, narcissistic buffoon. That's why we're still talking about Carter Page. That's why anyone even knows who John Durham is. That's why Republicans are still carrying on Mr. Durham's work by launching frivolous investigations that end with them embarrassing themselves by propping up obvious lies. It has always been about gaslighting the country. So instead of holding these farcical hearings about farcical investigations, I urge my colleagues my Republican colleagues, to get serious and start legislating on behalf of their constituents instead of helping the twice impeached, twice indicted Donald Trump further evade accountability. Thank you, and I yield back. General A yields back. Gentleman from Texas, recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Durham, I thank you for being here today, and, and thank you for your tireless work on this, as you called it, a, a very sobering report. Uh, the American people were forced to endure years of the Trump-Russia probe, and for what? I'll tell you why. It's because my Democrat colleagues across the aisle, the Clintons, the dishonest mainstream media, and the rest of the deep state have been terrified of Donald Trump from the beginning. And their hatred and fear remains today, from the 34-count felony indictment from the radical DA in Manhattan to the most recent 37-count felony indictment in mar lago They just won't stop. They won't stop. Mr. Durham, I want to walk through a few things for the American people in this 300-page this report on Crossfire Hurricane. For those that are watching who don't know, this was the code name for the investigation undertaken by the FBI into whether the Trump campaign was coordinating with Russia to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Durham, it says on page 9, at the direction of FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe and FBI Deputy Assistant Director for Counterintelligence Peter Strzok, Crossfire Hurricane was opened immediately. Is that correct? That's correct. 
First, let's talk about who these two characters were. On page nine of your report, it says Strzok and Deputy Director McCabe, special assistant, had pronounced hostile feelings, hostile feelings toward Trump. In text messages before and after the opening of Crossfire Hurricane, the two had referred to him as loathsome, an idiot, Donald Trump an idiot, someone who should lose to Clinton 100 million to zero, and Strzok once wrote, will stop, meaning Trump, from becoming president. So here we have these two leaders in the FBI, struck clearly expressing his hatred towards Trump from the beginning, opening an investigation six months before the 2016 election. And where are these two guys now? McCabe, he's been a contributor at CNN, the Clinton News Network, since 2019, and Strzok is an expert on the Marlago raid. Strzok is an expert on the Marlago raid, both continuing to dispel lies to the American people. On page 10 in your report, within days after opening Crossfire Hurricane, the FBI opened full investigations on members of the Trump campaign team. The FBI then began working on requests of the use of FISA authorities against Carter Page. Is that correct? That's correct. Folks, let me highlight who this American hero is. Carter Page was painted as an alleged Russian agent. Carter Page served his nation honorably. He was a Naval Academy graduate, and the FBI spied on Carter Page through the use of FISA authority. Sir, do you believe that this FISA warrant against Carter Page was flawed? Yes. Mr. Durham, Section 702 of, of, of FISA expires this year, and I'm sure you're familiar with FISA and Section 702. Just for the people listening at home, FISA stands for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was created in 1978. In 2008, FISA 702 was added. Section 702 was created for us to have the authority to spy on non-U.S. citizens, non-U.S. citizens. Mr. Durham, we all know that Carter Page is an American citizen who served his nation honorably, and yet the FBI conducted surveillance, including wiretaps, based on falsified information provided by agents in the FBI. Mr. Page was an honest American, innocent man, Mr. Durham, the FBI obviously abused its FISA authority. They went after Carter Page, and it's my intent, and I hope the intent of my colleagues, that we do not reauthorize Section 702 because the FBI cannot be trusted. Finally, I want to talk about Charles Dolan and Mr. Danchenko, who was the main source of the Steele dossier. Dolan had played multiple roles in the Democrat National Committee, Democrat Party. He worked on both Clinton campaigns, Bill and Hillary. He was working with them, friends. On page, of your 50, page 15 of your report, it says that in the summer and fall of 2016, Dolan and Denchenko traveled to Moscow in connection with a business conference. The business conference was held at the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow, which according to the Steele reports, was allegedly the site of salacious sexual conduct on the part of Trump. Parents, if you're watching, earmuffs for your kids now, folks. Put earmuffs for your children. Mr. Durham, was this salacious sexual conduct? What is that? Um, the allegation was that... Um, okay, don't, don't answer it. I will. Okay. Think about this, America. In the game of politics, it gets dirty and nasty. And the people will say anything to beat their opponent. But this is the government doing it. Even the director of the FBI, Comey, said, it's possible Trump was with hookers peeing on each other. Christopher Steele said an infamous Trump pee tape probably exists. Alleged pee tape incident was the only sex Trump party in Russia. You want to irritate the suburban mom at home? five months before an election, tell them the Republican leading candidate is peeing on prostitutes. We are aware of the member of this committee having an alleged affair with a Chinese spy, I refer to as Yum Yum, but this is a new law for anyone, and I would hope Mr. Swalwell would agree with me. Imagine if somebody would have said and taken it a step further, Mr. Swalwell was, was time peeing on Yum Yum. Time and the gentleman. It's unacceptable, this has got to stop. The FBI needs to... Time and the gentleman has expired. I yield back. Um, the gentleman... The gentleman Mr. Chairman, I ask that the last comments be stricken. With respect to Mr. Swalwell. I, all, my, my point is this. If you're going to say the President of the United States was in Russia peeing on prostitutes or vice versa, I'm just saying, could you imagine how that would affect any member of this committee? It would affect you. You're going to pick up a primary opponent, I'll guarantee that. That's a little different than making a specific allegation about a specific individual on this particular committee. Uh, the chair, By name. The chair, the, if I could, to the gentleman from Maryland, the chair has been very lenient in things being said. Previous speaker from the Democrats called the former president of the United States 
all kinds of things. And we sat here and let it go. Probably should have said something then. Maybe everyone should be careful about what they say. Um, and the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for his five minutes of uh, questioning. But, and we but, have to move fast. Before we get to that, Mr. Chairman, those rules don't cover the rules that govern this committee don't cover statements about. I'm talking about decorum. In I'm they just talking cover, about general decorum. They, they they do cover statements about members of the committee and members of the House. And that I've admonished the gen, I've admonished the gentleman. He should watch what he says, just like other members should watch what they say about the former president of our country. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for the five minutes of questioning. The former president is not a member of the committee. I, under, and is I, not I know that. Protected by the, the House rules. I understand that. Govern these kinds of statements. I understand that. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes to question the witness. Well, Mr. Durham, good afternoon. I uh, appreciate you being here. Although I'm sure, as you expressed earlier, there are probably other places you'd rather be. I, I did want to follow up on your prior testimony about um, uh, the trip that you and the attorney, the attorney general Barr took to Italy. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, about the, to elaborate on that, um, is it, I, I take it that was at the point prior to you becoming special counsel, but not by much. Is that right? Um, it was uh, prior to that. I think I think it was um, a while before. Um, the the dates I've got, just to help out, August 15 and September 27, 2019. Does that yeah. sound about right? Yeah, and I was appointed special counsel in October of 2020, so uh, more than a year before that. Okay, and why did you go on that trip? You know, I want to be careful as to what I'm authorized to, sure. to say here, speaking outside um, the report. But I think uh, members are probably aware of the fact that there was a particular person who supposedly had provided or had made statements to Papadopoulos. And Papadopoulos, not when he talked to the Australians, but when he was interviewed by the FBI, attributed information he had to this particular person who was a European. Um, there was reason to believe that that person was in Italy or had been in Italy. All right, and, 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 and let me ask just to follow up on that. Why, is, why did the Attorney General come with you to investigate that? Is, it, is, this is my understanding. And I mean, these weren't communications I had, but the Italian authorities wanted to deal with a person at an appropriate level, not with me. And so that's what that was about. It, that's my understanding. All right, but was it unusual for the Attorney General of the United States to uh, go on trips to uh, interview witnesses, whether overseas or even domestically? Yeah, he didn't, um, to my knowledge, uh, the Attorney General didn't interview any witnesses. His, he, what he was, my understanding was that in uh, accordance with what the Italian authorities wanted, he was going to go over, did go over, and um, introduce me uh, to them so that they would work with us to see if they could be of assistance in our locating a particular witness. All right, so he, he personally traveled to Italy in the pursuit of this uh, investigative lead. In opening the door for our group. To, to pursue an investigative Italians. lead. Yes, All right, sir. and then you said you'd been at the Department of Justice for 40 years? I have been. All right, do you recall the Attorney General of the United States ever taking a step like that uh, to travel overseas in pursuit of a lead in an investigation? You know, I, I, I don't know. It may happen all the time. I can only talk by my experience. This is the- Fair the enough, time. fair enough, fair enough. And I take it that whatever investigation was done over there in Italy didn't lead to any type of prosecution or investiga uh, 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 convict convictions in, in your investigation. That's correct. All right, I want to yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Schiff. Mr. Durham, did you uh, seek uh, communications pertaining to someone named Mr. Bernard uh, from a federal district judge? I'm not, let's, assuming that um, prosecutors go to judges for certain kinds of orders, they are typically sealed proceedings. I'm not speaking. And did you uh, seek an order direct to your question, but I'm not going to comment on anything that I believe is under seal. Did you seek uh, a court order to obtain personal communications? Returning to Mr. Bernard. I'm not going to speak beyond the uh, report on that point, and I'm not going to violate any Were you, uh, sealing orders. I don't think it violates any sealing orders to tell us if you sought personal communications by court order. Did you? Again, it's beyond well, the report. Well, well, let's not even subject it to sealing orders. To a person. Did you seek court orders to obtain particular records, and were you denied by the judge? 
I think the question is, you know, no, that, intended the to question suggest is that I, I don't the question want to is disclose what I, something I'm The question is what I asked you, Mr. Durham. Yeah. You get to give the answer, not the question. The question is, did you seek a court order to get records from a judge pertaining to private communications, and were you turned down by the judge for lack of a sufficient basis? Yeah. And I've told you Yes or no. I'm, it's beyond the report. I don't think I'm authorized to talk about it, and I'm not going to violate it's any It's not beyond the orders. report. It's not beyond the report. Do you see anything in the report about that? Uh, yes. Did you seek an order, and were you turned down? Okay. And then did you seek to go around the court order by going to the grand jury? No. Would you like to know what that was about? What I would like to know, Mr. Durham, is did, did Mrs. Danahy, who resigned from your team, raise ethical concerns about your trying to go around the court order? To my knowledge, no. Then why did she leave? I told you before, previously, that I have the highest regard for Ms. Danahy. Um, Ms. Danahy and I are friends. Um, Ms. Danahy, um, like you, you know why she left, right? I, 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 I'm not sure You do sure know the answer to the left. question. You know why she left, right? Yeah. Time the gentleman has expired. The chair now uh, recognizes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I might ask unanimous consent to offer sure. uh, two articles for the record. Uh, the first is uh, by Charlie Savage, Adam Goldman, and Katie Benner, how Barr's quest to find flaws in the, un in the Russian inquiry unraveled. Objection. And then the second is Anna Mamigliano, Mamigliano, sorry. Italy did not fuel U.S. suspicion of Russian meddling, Prime Minister says, without, both from the New York Times. Without objection, the gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Durham, I've got a number of things I want to ask you, but do you have a, do you desire to address what was being raised just now in fairness? Yeah, apparently um, Mr. Schiff's questions are from um, an unsourced New York Times article written by Charlie Savage. I don't believe that there's anything in that article that is attributed uh, to Ms. Danahy, and my recollection, I could be mistaken, but my recollection is that Ms. Danahy did not comment, um, wasn't quoted in any way in that article. So to the extent that the New York Times wrote an article suggesting certain things, you know, it is what it is. Right. All right. Was Danchenko's status as a paid informant, a confidential human source, concealed from you for any period of time? Um, I'm not sure there was concealed. We, we found that out. Uh, we were uh, once. Uh, when, when, when did you learn about it? When we started to um, the investigation and the uh, how long it took for the FBI to identify this principal subsource and why the principal subsource wasn't identified earlier. That's when we came across Denchenko. We then asked the bureau for. Uh, we found out he was a confidential human source. We asked the bureau for his informant file, and that's when we. Um, gleaned that uh, information. Okay, so it was from his informant file once you got that from the FBI. Was there any delay in furnishing that to you? Um, not that I recall, no. Do you have any recollection? You were investigating, you said, from May 2019. He was a CHS until October 2020. Yes. You know when in that period of time, roughly, you learned that he was a CHS? Um, you know, probably halfway through there, but I, 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 I would, I'm not, I'm not certain. Okay. Why didn't you interview him while he was a paid source for the FBI? Um, let me see. So with respect to um, Mr. Uh, Denchenko, he was um, interviewed by the Bureau in January 2017. We had brought it to the attention of the new administration and the FBI, Mr. Denchenko's circumstances, including the prior espionage case that they never resolved or uh, addressed. Right. I understand um, all those details. I'm asking why you didn't, why you didn't interview him. So when um, uh, we were dealing uh, with that section, Mr. Um, Danchenko was uh, represented by counsel. Um, Mr. Danchenko, as you may know in the normal course, um, you have to advise people whether they're subjects or targets of investigations, and we uh, did not arrive at a point in, uh, where we could interview Mr. Danchenko. Uh, FBI made um, Danchenko a CHS on March 7, 2017, after the factual predicate for the cross, crossfire hurricane in the Steele dossier uh, or, or, uh, had collapsed uh, in January 2017 in his interview because he could not corroborate the dossier, and he revealed to the FBI that he was not a Russian-based source, nor did he have a high-level network of sources. The next day, March 8, the FBI finalized talking points drafted by Lisa Page on direction of Andrew McCabe for use in briefing the Gang of Eight in Congress. Uh, and Congress was briefed prior to Director Comey's testimony on March 20. Now, 
Attorney General Barr told the nation in December 2019 that you were examining the continuation of the investigation beyond the January collapse of the supposed factual basis and looking at irregularities, misstatements, and omissions. Yet re your report makes no mention of the March 8 talking points prepared for Congress. Why? Um, I mean, aware that there were talking points because it just wasn't part of uh, the crux, of the central portion of what we were reporting on. I want uh, the uh, clerk to put up on the screen uh, what is uh, my submittal mark, mark number seven while I'm asking you this question. These talking points emerged into public as a defense exhibit in the Sussman case. They contained lurid allegations about Manafort operating high-level contacts with the Kremlin through Carter Page, that Steele had a primary subsource who was Russian-based, and that the primary subsource had a network of high-level Republican uh, of, of uh, subsources. Same garbage that Danchenko had, had debunked in his January interview. These talking points were circulated among senior FBI leaders and Department of Justice leaders, more than a dozen passed on them. Did you interview them all about how this could occur or consider this material as the basis of prosecutable offenses? Me, um, we identified and uh, interviewed uh, many uh, people in the FBI. Um, I guess I would have to know who this uh, particular email was circulated to to be able to tell you whether we interviewed uh, each of those persons or not. Um, last point, I guess, because I'm about out of time. Uh, you uh, identify the failure of the FBI to interview Dolan as sort of inexplicable, totally agree. But as I go through your report and look, there are people who declined to be interviewed, uh, not only Dolan, Danchenko, McComey, McCabe, Priestap, Strzok, Page, Glenn Simpson, among others, seems inexplicable to me that you didn't, de you didn't uh, compel their testimony. Can you explain that? At sure. All? Um, first, let me make it clear that um, it is um, as disappointing, perhaps more disappointing to me and my uh, colleagues that these people would not agree to be interviewed. Um, you know, some of them had a lot to say publicly, but they refused to um, uh, be interviewed by our folks. Let me explain. I'm not going to speak to any particular person because I don't want to violate any, any rules, but let me give you the general kinds of considerations that, that go into these things. First of all, the only way in which you can compel, as it were, a person's testimony uh, would be uh, to get a court order after somebody has asserted the Fifth Amendment privilege. So one factor, and there are multiple factors I'll go through here, but one factor is um, that a grand jury subpoena doesn't give a federal prosecutor the authority to simply force people to talk about things that the pr prosecutor, or in this instance, the investigative reviewers might be interested in. In order to properly use a grand jury uh, subpoena, you need to have an active um, grand jury investigation that's ongoing and a reasonable belief to believe that the person that you want to have come in has relevant information about that information. Otherwise, you run up against claims of grand jury abuse or claims of, uh, you know, trying to set a perjury trap or other bad faith uh, reasons. So Principal. you can't just subpoena people Understood. to make them talk. You can subpoena people when you believe that they have relevant uh, information. So that's a factor. We also take into consideration if a person has previously refused to cooperate, they won't cooperate with you um, on matters, even matters that they previously talked about. Um, and in, on prior occasions, those people have repeatedly said, I don't recall, I don't uh, remember, and so forth and so on. You have to make this sort of prudential judgment. Well, okay, if you were to subpoena a person because you can make an argument that they have information that might be relevant to the investigation, is it going to be worth the effort to have them come in and then repeatedly say, I don't recall, I don't recall? You look at the most sensitive piece of information that you all saw in the classified information, right? That, that source. Mr. Comey was asked about that in a congressional hearing under oath, and he didn't uh, recall it. Understood. So you make the decision, okay, are we likely to get something Mr. or not? Mr. Chair. Yep. We over? Yep. All right. General Thanks, Lady sir. from Vermont, our newest members recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Durham, thanks so much for being here. I know we've been at this for uh, hours now, um, but I'll, so I'll get right to it. Um, nothing in the report that I've heard so far today or, or that I've read exonerates Donald Trump. Um, you didn't find that his campaign did not overtly flirt <coughs> with Russia. You didn't find that he did not attempt to overturn the 2020 election. And you also cannot exonerate Donald Trump for the things 
He does in the future, obviously. Just as you cannot control the agenda of Congress or um, what we do here in our hearings under Chairman Jordan. And now, Mr. Durham, I don't necessarily agree with the origins of your investigation nor the conclusions that you reach in the report, but I do absolutely respect your position as special counsel and the actions of the DOJ as an independent entity. So, Mr. Durham, I think it's really important for us to establish, do you agree that it's important for the Justice Department to be independent from the rest of the executive branch? Yes. And I it mean, was obviously the, the Department of Justice plays some role in connection with the but must be independent decisions. Must have some independence. Right. And it was important to you that Attorney General Garland did not interfere with your special counsel investigation, correct? Correct. And in fact, as we mentioned earlier, you thanked him for giving you the latitude to operate without his involvement or interference. Correct? correct? But Donald Trump has consistently eroded the barrier between the DOJ and the rest of the executive branch. And during his administration, the, Trump interfered in Mueller's prosecutions, such as when he criticized Roger Stone's sentencing recommendations as, quote, horrible and very unfair, which resulted in the DOJ overturning its recommendation and all four career prosecutors handling the case actually withdrew within hours of that decision for ethical objections. Um, are you familiar with the Roger Stone sentencing recommendations? Do you follow that at all? I'm sorry, the Roger Stone sentencing recommendations? Yes. Um, no. I mean, I know there was one made, but I don't recall what it was. Okay, so regardless of um, the sentencing recommendations, is it appropriate for any present president to interfere with a special counsel's prosecutions? No, the special counsel is supposed to be independent of the Department of Justice. That's right. Not appropriate. Never appropriate. And Donald Trump has promised to do more of this if he's reelected. He has said it publicly on numerous occasions. So, Mr. Trump, should the DOJ continue to operate independently from the president, again, any president? Yes or no? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that one? Should the DOJ continue to operate independently from the president? Yes or no? Yes, the, the Department of Justice should operate uh, independently. Thank you, Mr. Durham. And as I said, Donald Trump has made it clear that if he is reelected, he wants to use the DOJ to go after his political enemies, regardless of the facts. And he has shown that he is willing to dismantle American democracy if it will put him on top. He has demonstrated his willingness to do this as president, and he's promised publicly to continue to do this if he is reelected. Taking apart our institutions is a refrain that we have heard over and over again from some of my Republican colleagues. And we even have seen um, a subcommittee created under Chairman Jordan that is essentially tasked with um, rooting out examples of our government being weaponized and that you know, those branches of government and those, um, those agencies within government that are trying to hold people accountable should be dismantled. And I think they're essentially being accused of weaponizing specifically because they're cho choosing to hold people accountable. I find that deeply disturbing as an American, um, and I think we all should be alarmed by this trend. I yield back. General Lee yields back. Gentleman from Texas recognized. Mr. Chair, if I could, I have um, some documents to ask Can to you do be. Real quickly, we, we, they're going to call votes. We want to get moving. Yep. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record William Barr's February 6, 2020 Objection. letter. Um, and I ask unanimous consent consent to enter into the record order number 4878-2020 from October 19, 2020. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just no, Texas. Mr. Chairman, is, can, can I just add one thing? Sure. I, I, I um, want to be sure that I understood your question. When you say the department should operate independently of the, of the White House, um, and, and I think in investigations and so forth and so on, that's absolutely true. 
the Department of Justice obviously plays a role in the executive branch of the government, represents the president on occasions, and so forth and so on. And so I was talking about should the White House interfere with criminal investigations and the like, and, and the answer is absolutely no. But in terms of them operating completely independent of, um, of the White House, that would not be accurate. They're part of the executive branch. Yeah. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Durham. Uh, October 3rd, 2016, the FBI offered Christopher Steele a million dollars to provide corroborating evidence of the allegations in his reporting. Is that correct? Yes. Was that paid to him? I'm sorry, was that what? Was that paid to him? Uh, that money was never paid out. There was right. no corroborating information. Mr. Steele relied solely on a single unnamed subsource, correct? Um, he said that he had a primary subsource who had a network of subsources. On October 18, 2016, the FBI, FBI submits the application for Pfizer surveillance relying heavily on the Steele dossier. No corroboration, correct? And no corroboration for the substantive claims in that. But they knew Steele was a signed up paid informant. Could have asked for sources, never did, said he was reliable, no record of reliability, correct? Mr. Steele had provided information in other areas, not in this area, in prior occasions. FISA application relied, according to your report, at least in part on the Clinton plan intelligence, correct? I'm sorry. Can and they, the FISA application relied, according to your report, at least in part on the Clinton plan intelligence, correct? Yes. And they knew Steele had been hired by Fusion GPS and Fusion had been hired by a law firm on, on behalf of senior Democrats and that HC was aware, correct? At various points in time, those things became known to the FBI, yes. And at December 2016, the FBI determined that Igor Danchenko, a Russian national, was previously subject to FBI investigation to be Steele's subsource, correct? Yes. They do not talk to Danchenko before the next FISA application, correct? Correct. January 12, 2017, the FBI goes back to renew the application for FISA surveillance, correct? Yes. Coincidentally, one week before Trump is inaugurated, correct? Correct. They then, after two trips to FISA, finally talked to Danchenko, basically determined it's all crap because they'd been relying on a Democrat, Democrat operative, Dolan, correct? Well, part of that is true. They um, uh, clearly had relied on the information in the Steele dossier. There was a portion of one report from Steele that was definitely tied to Mr. Dolan. Then in March of 2017, Jim Comey testified here on Capitol Hill that the FBI, under its counterintel authorities, has investigated Trump for collusion with Russia and people might get indicted, correct? Correct. Is it normal for the FBI director to talk about FISA-related investigations publicly? Um, As a general matter. I would say a general matter, I would say no. Right. And again, knowing full well the uncorroborated allegations and knowing full well the genesis of said investigation was tied to Hillary Clinton's campaign, which the FBI director would have known. People in the FBI knew that. Correct. April 2017, they go back to FISA. They report they've interviewed principal source and that the source is credible, but they leave out the entire fact that it's only credible and making clear that they had relied upon before was total garbage. They continued through the summer of 2017, correct? That's correct. Under federal law and FISA rules, once they know there is an error or some material fact is incorrect in previous applications, you're supposed to correct that, right? That's correct. Was that done here, yes or no? Not at the time. Was Deputy Director McCabe in charge of this investigation? Uh, Deputy Director McCabe had um, uh, direct involvement in the investigation. Was Deputy Assistant Director Peter Strzok heavily involved in the investigation? And was FBI Director Comey briefed on the investigation? The evidence that we, just, uh, uh, on, um, that we came upon was, yeah, they were definitely, this is driven by each, the seventh floor. Each FISA application is a verified application, and there's a Woods file with every factual assertion kept in a file, correct? Correct. Is it reasonable to believe that senior FBI leadership, and indeed senior leadership at the DOJ, did not know all these failures to ensure truthful facts were used for each FISA application, an application directly focused on an American presidential campaign? Is it reasonable to believe that the senior FBI leadership, and indeed senior leadership at DOJ, did not know these failures? That um, I would distinguish between what the FBI knew and what the Department of Justice uh, knew. So FBI leadership knew it? The FBI, uh, people in the FBI knew this information. Not everybody knew everything, but they had all of this information. So two final questions. In the fall of 2021, our colleague, Mr. Schiff, said in an interview, but at the beginning of the Russia investigation, I said that any allegations should be investigated. We couldn't have known, for example, people were lying to Christopher Steele. Is it remotely, remotely conceivable that the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee and the lead prosecutor of the impeachment of President Trump was uninformed that this investigation was kicked off based on a Clinton campaign Democrat-funded report with a witness, Mr. Steele, claiming facts that were uncorroborated and that ultimately came from a subsource, a Democrat operative, Mr. Dolan. Is that conceivable? Um, you know, 
And is in fact, there evidence out of the House Intelligence Committee that directly contradicts that and that he did know, in fact. I, yeah, I wouldn't know what Mr. Schiff would know um, but at the time. Finally, a final question. For the average American watching this, besides being fired, have Jim Comey, Andrew McCabe, or Peter Strzok been held accountable for these glaring violations? Have they been hauled before a grand jury or charged in any way? And if not, why not? So they have not been, um, well, I'm not gonna talk about matters that occurred before the grand jury because I can't. Um, but with respect to have uh, any of those individuals been charged, the answer is no. I yield back. Now the gentleman has expired, the gentleman from Texas, the other gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much for appearing today. I really appreciate it. I want to tell you about how my friends, neighbors in Tomball, Spring, Texas, and of course, Americans across this country are feeling today after listening to this. They feel that we have a two-tiered justice system in this country, and it's terrifying. So I applaud your work. I actually find you to be sincere in working on behalf of the American people, and I recognize that. Um, but I also feel like we need to hold the people accountable who have participated in the sham of an investigation. I'm gonna tell you why. What happened in 2016 was unprecedented. The same government agencies that were investigating President Trump and his campaign were looking the other way when it came to the allegations against the Clintons. At the same time, the Clinton campaign paid for the Steele dossier, the DOJ and FBI were helping to cover up Clinton's crimes. We know this to be a fact. 33,000 emails miraculously disappeared. Phones were smashed with hammers by the FBI. Even CNN fact-checked this, and it turned out to be true. Yes, CNN. And they refused to prosecute her. This selective prosecution doesn't only favor the Clintons, though, as we have seen in very recent history. Sir, I'm sure you are familiar with what's going on with Hunter Biden's plea deal and his refusal to pay his taxes and the separate agreement to dismiss his felony gun possession, both of which were announced yesterday. You familiar with that, sir? Yes. Hunter Biden will likely serve no jail time for his offenses, and, and yet there was no early morning SWAT raid on Hunter's home in coordination with the media either. The American people are sick and tired of this two-tiered justice system, and as a black man, I'm tired of seeing this kind of discretion used to favor people like Hunter Biden because he's white and a son of a president. And while Hunter Biden will serve no jail time for these charges, black men across this country are in prison for years for the exact same crimes, and I'm not surprised because I guess this selective justice shouldn't become as a surprise to anyone in this room, because after all, Joe Biden was one of the authors of the 94 crime bill, one of my all-time favorites. And we could see what that has done to black men across this country. But back to this report. This report concerns one of many investigations into Trump that led absolutely nowhere, wasted vast amounts of resources and time, and spread lies, rumors, and innuendos about Trump across this country. What we know is that the Clinton campaign and the DNC paid for the Steele dossier, which was used as a basis for the FISA warrants to spy on an incoming president, correct, sir? It was paid, much of that, the dossier was paid for from the campaign uh, through Bob Perkins, uh, Cooey's hiring of Fusion and Fusion's hiring of Steel. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, sir. The biggest problem that I have with that is that none of the, none of the significance has been prosecuted over this sham investigation, and, and no one who participated in this investigation is serving any jail time today. I think we've kind of heard that resonate throughout the halls of this room today. But meanwhile, the DOJ, the same agency that is responsible for this phony investigation in 2016, is at this very moment seeking to put Donald Trump in prison for over 400 years over a document issue. And last I checked, President Biden has a bit of a document issue himself before he was even the sitting president of this country. And again, it's another example of this two-tier justice system. My colleagues on the left talk about democracy. Well, here's what I know about democracy. In 2016, Donald Trump was elected by the American people to be their commander in chief, but he wasn't allowed to serve in that capacity because he and his administration spent four years responding to Democrat invented scandal after Democrat invented scandal. And here we are, seven years later, still talking about President Trump and this Democrat invented scandal. And this does not look like a democracy to me. 
As a West Point graduate and combat veteran, I've fought abroad against authoritarian countries. I know what they look like, and I know what, the, what those countries do and how they treat their people, and I also know what democracy looks like. And my fear is that this looks like the death of democracy, and it's up to us in this room to do something about it. Sir, I cannot thank you very much for your time. Thank you for hanging in there. I really appreciate it. I yield back the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Durham, did you see evidence of collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign in 2016? No. So the American public that has been uh, told this hoax for years, it was just that, a hoax. Is that correct? Our investigation showed that there were a lot of failures in the FBI and how they did this investigation that did not disclose or reveal information uh, or evidence concerning any conspiracy or collusion between Mr. Trump and Russian authorities. Um, by the way, I hope you'll give me a full five minutes, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, are you familiar um, with the January 5th, 2017 meeting that ha was held in the White House? Uh, President Obama was there. Vice President Biden was there. Susan Rice was there and others. Are you familiar with that meeting? I know that that meeting occurred. Um, do you know that uh, FBI Director James Comey was there? That's my understanding. Um, did you get access or try to get access to uh, Director Comey's notes? Um, we reviewed, yeah, in connection with our inquiry, we looked at um, phone records, notes, those sorts of things. I don't, I don't recall seeing any notes of uh, Mr. Comey's from, from that meeting. They could exist, but I don't recall having seen them. So as special counsel, you were authorized to investigate whether any federal official employer or any other person violated the law in connection with individuals associated with campaigns and individuals with the administration, including Crossfire Hurricane. Did you think this wasn't relevant to go after these notes? I mean, January 5th, 2017, we're in the process of the transition. Um, weren't you um, um, inquisitive about that? Yeah, as I, as I say, I don't know. We had um, sought from the FBI uh, all such records. What I can't tell you is that uh, there were any records. That, that's what I'm saying. Could you repeat that last answer? Sure. Uh, when um, I think as we re, uh, set out in the report, the Bureau produced in excess of, uh, I think it was uh, 6,800,000 ,800 pages of records that were reviewed. Among the records that we sought from the FBI uh, were relevant um, notes, records, uh, uh, telephone records, and the like. What I can't tell you is whether, and Mr. Comey uh, being one of them, um, what I can't tell you, because I just don't know, is whether or not there were notes of Mr. Comey's from that, uh, from that meeting. Are you aware that in 2017, prior to the Department of Justice filing a motion to dismiss the case against General Flynn, they interviewed Mr. Priestap? Um, yes. During that interview, the Department of Justice found Mr. Priestap's notes, which suggested that the FBI was trying to entrap Mr. Flynn. Why didn't you, um, why didn't you interview Mr. Priestap? Why do you think it wasn't relevant to subpoena Mr. Priestap to gather information on his involvement with Crossfire Hurricane, especially the Attorney General at the time said they were trying to lay a perjury trap for Mr. Flynn? Sure. So as I uh, relate specifically to uh, Mr. Priestap, and I, this reflected in the report, uh, Mr. Priestap did agree to talk to us with regard to the Alpha Bank matter. So we interviewed him um, uh, on that matter. He was not willing to talk uh, beyond that. Um, as previously indicated, um, we were disappointed with some of these decisions on the part of high-ranking members of the FBI not to cooperate as, as you are. Uh, but there are reasons. You have to, when, if you're going to subpoena somebody to the grand jury, um, which is one of the more powerful tools that you have, you've got to look at a number of factors to determine whether or not it's appropriate, whether it makes sense, whether it be productive. And in, in this case, not speaking to um, Mr. Priestep's situation, um, alone, but one of the decisions was, okay, does Priestep have information that would be relevant or is likely to be relevant to the matter, criminal matters, not the general inquiry into what happened in the investigation of the campaign, but the criminal matters 
the grand jury is looking at or not. Mr. Durham, I only, ha I only have 30 seconds here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we're very disappointed also. I keep hearing this term, disappointed, all